Hi, I'm Ron Hall, and this is how you sell without selling out. Roger's that. All right, hi, everybody. I'm Rogers Healy, and welcome to Rogers That, a podcast dedicated to selling without selling out. And today we have someone who is the consummate salesperson uh, because at the end of the day, what he has done a better job of is selling himself, his brand, his story, as well as anybody I've ever come across. Um, he has a background in dealing fine art to fine people, uh, but among all of his background, all of his successes, I just found out we were in the same fraternity. He went to TCU. Unfortunately, uh, I went to SMU. But uh, Ron Hall has become a quick friend. I met him through another storyteller, and Ron is a storyteller in the sense of uh, old school stories, whether it's a book, a movie about his life, um, or it's the story of art. But Ron does uh, an incredible job of just sharing his story, where the minute you meet him, the minute you hear him talk, the second you meet him, the second you hear him talk, you feel like you're home. You feel like you're safe. And I tell you this to where it reminds me of my first real introduction to Ron was through his movie, Same Kind of Different as Me. And uh, Ron is going to share a little bit about that. But to bring it back full circle with my family and my moment, uh, during COVID, every single week, at least once a week, from March 11th until probably end of October, the one constant we had in our life was watching this movie. And we would turn it on. And it would just give us a piece, uh, a piece, a sense of peace and comfort. And so to have him in here today to share his story from art, living on the Murkison estate, to having a movie about his life, a children's book, and a follow-up movie and book, which we're going to learn about his, uh, today, just proves the power of connection. And so it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Ron Hall, the man with the greatest hair in Dallas, as he says, <laughs> and uh, the fashion sense that is unmatched um, is on the podcast today. So ladies and gentlemen, Ron Hall. Well, speaking of hair, I, at my age, 77, I'm lucky to have hair. At your age, obviously, you have uh, great hair as well, so I have to say that that's the catfish calling the bullfrog big mouth. Well, that's an ism right there. I think that's <laughs> the catfish calling the bull. That's, that's, and I feel like there's a little bit of, uh, of, of small-town Texas in the ism you just gave oh, us. So lots of, lots of small-town Texas. Me, I grew up on a ranch. My grandfather was a cowboy, a rancher, and, uh, in fact, I was just went – this past weekend to celebrate my uncle, uh, Uncle Buddy, in Henderson, Texas, his 100th birthday. His name's Uncle Buddy? Uncle Buddy. is. My, I, I approve of that. So anyway, a great Texan. And uh, in fact, he got his picture on the jar of Smucker's Jelly. Oh, wow. Week. On the today, on good morning, or today Show, Good Morning America? I, I don't know, but just on the jelly. I got the jar of the jelly to prove it. Wow. But anyway, I grew up on a ranch, and uh, so therefore we had a lot of a lot of sayings. In fact, as a as a kid, if you were my grandfather's grandchild and you were had you already celebrated your fourth birthday, your Christmas present was a newborn calf every year. You had to ride that calf on Christmas morning, or it wasn't yours. Wow. So the first thing you did on Christmas morning, he lined up the grandkids in the corral and put them on the brand new calf, and you had to ride that calf. So, wow. Do you have grandchildren? I do have grandchildren. What did you give them for their <laughs> Christmas gift? A uh, book? Well, <laughs> I didn't give them uh, that experience because the mothers wouldn't allow that. So. Fair. <laughs> so an art dealer, a movie uh, maker, a storyteller, and also a, a, a risk uh, remover. Uh, there's a reason you didn't give them a calf, but... Get us, uh, get us inside the head of uh, one of America's treasures. You know what, what led you to all your crazy stories? That when we had coffee, I was just sitting there. I look yeah. up. I was like, it's been an hour and a half, and I mm -hmm. really feel like I haven't even gotten to chapter one of, of the story. But you know, you you know you have a gift, right? And you you probably knew this living in a smaller town and you know being around cattle right. and being around probably chickens and goats oh, and roosters. Kind of yeah. Uh, what was the uh, evolution that led you to where you're at today? Well, what really happened was when it came, I became old enough to go to school. We had to move into town. And so we moved into Fort Worth, Texas. And we moved in, we, we were all just poor farmers. My father had just returned uh, from the war, World War II. And um, so we had to move into town. And so anyway, I got a job as a paper boy when I was eight years old, throwing the paper. And I wouldn't take no for an answer. And so I would knock doors and until they would uh, agree to subscribe to the paper for $1 a month, 
then I wouldn't let them go. But uh, so I, I had I had 278 papers in my neighborhood that I threw every day, and never taking no for an answer. But if I did happen to get a no, uh, I always realized that every no got me one step closer to a yes. Mm. So I've never been able to take no for an answer. And when I had a book to publish the first time, same kind of difference as me, it was my first book, my first attempt at writing a book. And uh, I'll, I'll get to that uh, just here quickly because I know we don't have much time. But um, I was turned down by every publisher. How old were you? When, I, when that happened? Yeah. I was 50, see, let's see. Well, let's see. When I finished the book, I was probably 58. Okay. And so you go through the same process of people not wanting a newspaper, but realizing that a no, in some cases, is a potential yes. Yes. How, how long did that take? And by the way, we just skipped over a few decades of your life. You go from being the paper boy to well, being 58 years old. Well, paper boy, okay. Then uh, TCU. Uh, actually, I started at a small school in the East because I couldn't get into any big schools. The East Coast or East Texas? Uh East Texas. Yeah, East Texas. <laughs> yeah. Why did you have to ask me that? You mean like like Villanova? No. That's the line I used when I finally got into TCU as a Fair. sophomore. They said, well, where did you go your freshman year? And I always say, a small school in the East. It's like when people ask me where I went to college, they go, undergrad? They go, yeah, where'd you go undergrad? SMU. And they just assume I went to grad school, but I didn't. I just went to, I went to undergrad. <laughs> well, I went to East Texas State my freshman year. Yeah, so, fair. And then so you, that's a small school in the East. You transferred west, you know, with, I did, with the gold yeah. rush. You come to, come to TCU and... Yeah. and and, and so what happened there? What happened in school? Or did you At learn TCU, your... the reason I wanted to go to TCU is to read, uh, just to meet a rich girl because I heard <laughs> all the rich girls were that. So what I majored in, Sigma Chi and rich girls. And wow. I was Rush chairman. And so was I. Oh. Yeah. Golly, this is crazy. So anyway, um, but that didn't serve me well because by the time I was a senior, I had a 1.8 grade point average. 1.75. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And so I got drafted into the U.S. military, Uncle Sam's Army, wow. uh, right during the middle of the Vietnam War. And so I was jerked right out of TCU, given a rifle and in a fatigue uniform, and I spent two years in the Army. Wow. So when I came back, I came back with a renewed passion to, uh, to excel. And so my last, uh, like, 45 hours of TCU, I had a 4.0 grade average, and then I stayed and got an MBA with a 4.0 grade average. But that's what the Army will do to you. It will certainly make you appreciate uh, sitting in a classroom. So, yeah. But anyway, from that, I, uh, I started just as a municipal bond trader, as a, investment banking. I hated that. And uh, I happened into an art museum in Houston, Texas, on the very first week I was a municipal bond trader. And at the art museum in Houston, Texas, my life was changed uh, because I realized that I had there was a great love there for art that I didn't know I had. And then shortly uh, the, after that, like a few hours later, I ended up in an art gallery in Houston, Texas. And I wrote a hot check for $3,500 to buy my first painting. Because uh, I only made seven thousand dollars a year as uh, at the for, at the First National Bank of Fort Worth, but this art dealer who was the best salesman ever convinced me that I could afford a thirty-five hundred dollar painting. I hadn't even gotten my first check, which was going to be six hundred dollars, hmm. and I'm already writing a hot check for thirty-five hundred. And I had to go borrow the money from my bank on a ninety-day note, and they told me that I, if I did not pay it off in ninety days, I would lose my job. But did you keep the painting? No, I sold it in 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> did you make a profit? I had no, I had no money. Did you make I a profit to, on, the, on the painting? I made $2,000, which wow. was uh, more than my three months' salary. Wow. And I was never happy as a banker after that. And so I began trading art on the sides until in 1975. I was making more at, in my side gig of trading art than I made as a <clears throat> vice president of the bank. I had elevated in four years to a vice president level. And so was this a, a, an interesting path where back when this is the mid seventies and the essentially flipping art concept, was that, were you part of the pioneering of that whole realm of, of the industry? I don't know that I was a, a pioneer because uh, Sir Joseph Devine back in the 30s and 20s and 30s was, I think, the pioneer of 
being of the art business as we know it today. Hmm. And uh, it's a fascinating story to read about uh, Sir Joseph Devine. Well, so, so again, okay, now we went back from, you know, trying to, t that at 58 years old, and here we are in the mid-70s. So the gap okay. in between then, you know, you the have some life happen. You get I married. I had life happen. I got married you have your, your to son. Uh, a tridelt from TCU. And, mission accomplished. And mission accomplished, but she wasn't rich. Oh, not know. yet. But she made my life rich. Yeah. And so that was the difference. But, uh, yeah, she was the only poor girl at TCU, and I was the poorest kid, uh, mm. the guy at TCU. But we made it work. And um, anyway, fast forward, uh, we ended up moving to Dallas. Uh, we raised our children in Highland Park, and they went to uh, the Highland Park High Schools, and then... After that, we decided to move back to Fort Worth to be closer to our ranch. We had uh, bought a ranch. That was my lifelong passion was to get back to ranching. And so I had purchased a ranch when I was 40 years old, and, and I wanted to get back there and be a part of this ranch. So we decided to move back to Fort Worth. And w at the move back to Fort Worth, we had built a new dream home that uh, housed our contemporary art collection. I had amassed what I thought was a fantastic contemporary art collection. And I built a home just to show off that art. But in this dream home, my late wife, Debbie, had a dream. And the first night she dreamed uh, of a new homeless shelter that was going to be in, unlike any homeless shelter that had ever been built in America. And then the next night, she had a dream that was so profound, she woke me the next morning and shaking me, saying, Ron, Last night I had the most amazing dream of, um, of a homeless man. She said, I saw his face. And she said, it was like a verse in the Bible, Ecclesiastes 9.15. I'll never forget this. She said, there was found in the city, uh, the Solomon wrote this, there was found in the city a certain poor man who was wise, and by his wisdom, the city and lives were changed, yet no one knew his name. She said, I believe that my dream is from God so strongly that I want you to go with me today, this morning. Let's go walk in the inner city of Fort Worth where the homeless are and see if I can find this man in my dream. So, but I knew she wasn't crazy because she was one of the smartest girls at TCU. So I accompanied her that morning. We got in the car and we drove to the inner city where all the homeless encampments were. And we began looking for this man in her dream. And uh, we didn't find him the first day. But um, by the end of the day, and we had not seen the man in her dream, she said, well, let's go over to this uh, homeless shelter. There was just a rundown old uh, cinder block flop house homeless shelter that fed the homeless there. It's called the Union Gospel Mission. So we went over and uh, told the uh, director we'd like to start volunteering to serve an evening meal. And he was excited about that. They needed volunteers. So we began serving, and we'd been there about a week. When uh, we were getting ready to serve the evening meal, standing behind a stainless steel serving counter, and the men came out of a chapel service. There were probably 200 men coming out of the chapel service. And then in a side door, in storms this giant-looking man with no shirt, no shoes, and just some raggedy old unzipped khakis, and he starts screaming at the top of his voice, I'm going to kill whoever done it. I'm going to kill whoever stole my shoes. I've never been so scared in my life because all of a sudden there was mass pandemonium in the dining hall, and he started overturning tables and throwing punches and screaming obscenities, and I hit my knees to the floor and hid under the St. Lucille serving counter. And... Uh, so as I hear this pandemonium going on, uh, and, and, and I've, there's about 20 men involved in a fight by then, so I begin to wonder, wonder what happened to my wife, Debbie? Wonder what happened to her? And um, so I looked from my little hiding place, and I saw her. She was so excited. She was jumping up and down like a cheerleader on the sideline of a football game. And she was saying, that's him. That's him. And I said, that's who? And she said, that's the man in my dream. I said, which one? And she said, the one who threatened to kill everybody. 
And then she looked down at me, and I'm still on my knees. I could, people would have thought I was praying, but I wasn't. I'm just hiding. So, uh, and I'm still on my knees, and she said, and I believe I heard from God that you have to be his friend, Ron, and find out if my dream is real. And I said, but honey, I was not at that meeting you had with God. And if I'm going to be friends with someone who wants to kill everybody, I think I should go talk to God myself. (laughs) But I asked this homeless man who was working with us on, on the serving line, I said, who is that crazy man? He said, no one knows his name. Most people call him suicide because you know, messing with him is the equivalent of committing suicide. Some people call him the lion of the jungle because he's been on the streets longer than anyone can remember. And he rules the streets with fear and intimidation. Mm. So, you know, that is how the story got started. Mm. Okay. So you, you, you have a moment where your wife's vision, her, her dream is now both your reality and you're faced Mm -hmm. in this situation where, you know, you did what a lot of people are afraid to do is, is you kind of faced it with her. And then from there, your story was born. It was uh, not quite that easily, though, because even though when she told me that um, she thought that uh, I, she had heard from God that I had to be his friend, you know, I decided that I would have a little conversation with God that night. So I went home and... Um, Though I didn't hear an audible voice, I know in my mind I heard God say to me, you know, being friends with a homeless man is a small price to pay for the forgiveness that I have shown to you in your life. And I thought, wow, all right, I'm going to give it a shot. So I began pursuing a friendship with this homeless man on a daily basis for five months till I could finally get him in my car. And I went into the inner city every day driving in. And I would usually see him uh, on the streets, by the hobo jungle, by his dumpster that he claimed as his own. But as soon as he would see me or my pickup driving up, um, he would take off and run into the hobo jungle, which I was not going to go in the hobo jungle. That would be a death sentence for someone like me. But um, it took me five months to get him in in my car. And so um, we were, we go to breakfast that morning and he asked me, he said, what is it you want from me? He said, I've had no peace in my life since you and your skinny little wife showed up on the streets of Fort Worth. And I said, man, I just want to be your friend. Well, that was a lie. Actually, I didn't want to be his friend. Debbie wanted me to be his friend. And I was paying penance for having been a bad husband. So I was going to do whatever she asked me to do. So anyway, um, through the end, at the end of the breakfast, he, uh, he said, you mind if I ask you a personal question? I said, no, you can ask me. I didn't know what he was going to ask me. But he said, uh, he said, what's your name? And I said, well, my name is Ron, you know, like Mr. Ron. I said, uh, what's your name? He said, I don't tell anybody my name. I said, well, I know it's not suicide. But said, you, don't mind, you won't tell me your name. So he thought about it, and he said, my name's Denver. And he said, there's something I heard about you white folks that bothers me, and, and i, I got to have an answer before I decide if I'm going to be your friend. And I said, well, what is that? He said, well, I heard when white folks go fishing, they do this thing they call catch and release. I said, well, Denver, I'm not a fisherman. I said, I'm a rancher, a cowboy, an art dealer. I know a little bit about those things, but really, I don't even own a tackle box or a rod and reel. He said, but I bet you can answer my question. I said, okay, so ask. He said, okay. He said, I heard that when white folks go fishing, they do this thing called catch and release. And he said, um, I said, well, it's a sport, Denver. You don't get it. He said, no, sir, I don't get it. Because back on the plantation where I grew up in Louisiana, we'd go out in the morning, we'd dig us a can full of worms, we'd cut us a cane pole. We, when we finally got something on our line, we were proud of it, and we'd take it back to the fan plantation and share it with all the folk. He said, well, it just occurred to me, if you're a white man fishing for a friend, and you're going to catch and release, then I ain't got no desire to be your friend. Mm. He said, but... If you're fishing for a real friend, I'll be your friend for life. And my mind flashed back to Debbie's dream of a poor man who was wise, and by his wisdom, our city and our lives would be changed. Because what he spoke to me at that moment was the wisest thing I'd ever heard on friendship. So I thought he must really be a wise man. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I said, okay, we'll, we'll, I'll be your friend. The next morning, I show up on the inner city streets where he lived by his dumpster. And I sat down on the curb next to him. And I was still uneasy and I was scared and he stunk to high heaven. You know, we lived by a dumpster and so <clears throat> I could only smell those smells. But I'm sitting on the curb and he didn't even say hello. He didn't say anything. He just looked at me like really angry and said, and I, like, what are you doing here without saying anything? And so I got really scared again because, I mean, the man, they called him suicide. So <laughs> Just figured, the two of you? Huh? Was it just the two of you? Just the two of us. So finally, I just broke the silence and I said, well, hey, man, can you tell me what it's like to be homeless? And he said angrily and shot back a drill bit stare into my eyes. And he said, well, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? I said, man, I've never been homeless. I, I live in a nice home. I, I, I don't have an answer for that. He said, well, let me tell you something. And he's pointing at me. Whether we's rich or whether we's poor or something in between, this earth ain't no final resting place. He said, so in a way, we all homeless, just working our way home. And that's what I named my new book, Working Our Way Home. And that's a picture of uh, Denver and me at our ranch uh, because we became best friends. He became a part of our lives. And this poor man who was wise became the wisest man I've ever known. And um, just a few days after we began this friendship, uh, he told me that something bad was getting ready to happen to my wife. And three days later, she was diagnosed with cancer. And for the next 19 months, the man that I once thought had nothing to offer me in a friendship became the most valued friend we ever had. And he would show up at our doorstep every morning or at the hospital, wherever we were during this 19 months of battling cancer, with a fresh, relevant message that he claimed he had heard from God in the night. And he would deliver it to us that day as a blessing to us. And, uh, and even on the final day of her life, he came to say that he was talking to God last night. He said, I need to have a private moment with Miss Debbie. He said, God told me to, I had to tell her something. So he went in her room and he told me and her this was going to be the last day of her life. So he went in to say, Miss Debbie, I was talking to God last night and he's, he said, he, the only reason you've been hanging on this long is because you don't know who's going to carry your torch for the homeless when you pass. But God told me last night, he said, Denver, you pick up Miss Debbie's torch and you carry it for the rest of your life. And uh, so anyway, she asked him if she if if she let go and went to be in heaven, if he would pick up the torch. And he said, yes. And she said, will you speak at my service then? And he said, yes, ma'am, I'll speak at your service. And so the man that we didn't even go over this, the story is way too complicated, Rogers, to even touch on this. But as a young man at 13 years old, he had been roped and dragged by the Ku Klux Klan for helping a white woman change a flat tire. And the Klansman made him promise that day that he would never again speak to a white woman. So Miss Debbie was the first white woman that he'd ever spoken to. And so that, at that moment, he kneeled beside her bed and gave her a kiss on the forehead and said, I'll see you on the other side, Miss Debbie. So I went in right after that moment, and she said, Ron, please don't give up on Denver. God is going to bless your friendship in a way that you can never imagine. And so later that evening, she went to heaven, and three days later, he showed up at her service. In fact, I didn't think he was going to show up because he answered the phone earlier and said he was sick. But he showed up the service and brought some homeless people with him. And he got up uh, at the uh, podium and began speaking. And when he got through, he got a standing ovation from more than a thousand people at a funeral. It was the most wonderful, memorable experience I've ever seen in my life. And he shared her vision for a new homeless mission in Fort Worth. And by noon the next day, more than $500,000 came in from the people that had been at the funeral. And within one year, $5 million. And now, 20 years later, more than $50 million 
has been raised as a result of our story to build the finest homeless mission in America, the Fort Worth Union Gospel Mission, which is in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Oh my God. Um, wow. Um, yeah, so, I mean, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I know you've shared your story, and every time you share it, it's a different audience and a different impact, but, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, thank you for, thank you for sharing that part of it. Um, can we can we keep talking a little bit and so absolutely i don't have to be i have a speaking engagement in colorado <laughs> on the 23rd <laughs> okay well we have 16 days <laughs> okay uh, so again you you carry on your your lovely life's legacy and and you befriend denver and you know again this could we could go many different directions here with the stuff that you shared last week about living in the Murkison estate to yeah. in any other iteration, but maybe keeping it with the theme of, of selling, right? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily selling a product, even though you did. Right. What was the moment where you realized your story needed to be told to a grander scale where you enter the <laughs> world of you're a, a literary, uh, you know, you need an agent, right. you need a publisher, all these things where, you know, it's probably like having a podcast. Everyone has a book, yeah. right? At what, 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 what moment did you realize it needed to be relatively commercialized for, like me, my wife, for us to see it? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, after Debbie died, uh, I, and, and she asked me not to give up on Denver, but I did exactly what she asked me not to do. As soon as Debbie died, I took off and went to uh, Italy, and stayed there for nearly six months. Let's t- let's do a little real estate story. How big was the property you were in in Italy? I, I meant to bring pictures of it, but I I'd say it was a minimum of maybe twenty five, thirty thousand square feet. It could have been as big as fifty thousand square feet. It was mm. this enormous. So not like an Airbnb kind of. <laughs> this was an Airbnb castle. Well, I was just a guest of an artist named Julio Laraz. Uh, and he and his family lived in the, what used to be the summer residence of the Pope in Fiesoli above Florence. Oh, of course. Yeah. So uh, I was at a La Quinta uh, uh, yeah, in yeah. Houston one time. You but, were at the, uh, <laughs> the, the king of Italy, uh, his 50,000 square foot house. So, so you go there and you, you know, go through a quest of, of the next phase of your life, right? You're at, a, you're at a young age, you're yeah. starting over, you've got children, you are, a, a, you know, a widower and... Mm-hmm you, you kind of have a moment where you realize, okay, like this is all, this is, it's crazy, right? You go share this story with someone that you don't have your book or your movie out there and be like, uh-huh, that you're a lunatic, but mm-hmm. it's, you know, your, your life is a movie. Literally, your life is literally a movie. But at what point did you realize you needed to put pen to paper? And well, turn this it, it into was there. Different? In fact, um, I, as when I landed in Rome to go there, I checked in the hotel. It was called the Columbus Hotel, and it's where Columbus, the last place that he stayed before he began <clears throat> his voyage, or when he came to, I don't know what it was, but C- Christopher Columbus had stayed in that hotel before his big voyage to uh, discover America. Was it maybe around 1492, right before <laughs> he sailed the ocean blue? I think so, wow. yes. See? So he... he um, and so I thought, I'm on a voyage too. Here I am at this hotel where Christopher Columbus set off on a voyage. And I am at this uh, here. So I just got some paper from the front desk and a pen, and I just started writing notes and writing, trying to see if, see if I could actually uh, write something. Because uh, right before I left, Denver and I were working at, uh, we had gone right after her death. We went back to the ranch. We buried her at our ranch. So we were building a proper cemetery. We just picked out the most beautiful, highest point on the ranch overlooking the Brazos River. And we just dug a grave and buried her there. And so we went back to build a rock wall around it and an arch and all of these kind of things. And we spent two or three weeks to do that before I took off for Italy. But at that point, he was laughing one day hysterically, and I said, what's so dang funny, Denver? I mean, this is a kind of a solemn moment here. We're building this uh, cemetery. And he said, think about this, Mr. Ron. He said, uh, nobody's going to believe our story. We got to write us a book. And I said, well, what is this we, Kimosabi? You don't read and you don't write, so who's going to write the book? He said, well, you know, I know my part, and I'm going to tell it to you, and you write it down. You already know your part, so you write that down, and when we get through, we're going to put those two together, and that's going to be our book. 
So uh, when I came back from Italy, I, I all of a sudden became convinced while I was in Italy that I had done exactly what Debbie had asked me not to do, was catch and release Denver, because I'd sent him back to the hobo jungle, and I was in Italy. So I got convicted to go back. So I came back. I got him in the hole from the hobo jungle and he moved in with me. And for the next three and a half years, we sat at the breakfast table and we wrote us a book. But then when we got through with it, as I told you earlier, we couldn't give it away. Nobody wanted a book from a, an old art dealer and a homeless guy. And so therefore, uh, I just self-published it because I, I knew the story was great and I wanted to get it out and I wanted to raise money to build this mission and name it after Debbie. And so I published, self-published the book and I just gave away copies. I didn't sell one copy. I just gave them away. But one of our self-published copies got in the hands of HarperCollins and they republished it under their brand. And uh, that's where same kind of different as me happened. And incidentally, they had turned me down twice before uh, they called me and said, hey, we read one of your self-published books and we'd like to publish it. I said, it's interesting because you guys have turned, had turned me down twice before. Yeah, I mean, did you feel like you were on a mission, though? Like you had a different reason to get the story out there. So there was no, there was no quitting. Well, yeah, there was no quitting, no selling out. So uh, I knew I had to sell this book and I had to get people to help me uh, raise the money to build this mission because it was a great need and it was Debbie's vision. It was her first l literal dream in a long time to build a new homeless mission in Fort Worth, unlike any mission ever been built in America. Hmm. So we built that for her. And so, um, so the book, the book takes off. The book takes off. The well, book, the book didn't initially take off. The book once it got into Harper Collins' hands. It started to Once it got in Barbara Bush's hands. Oh, well, tell us the story there. So I, Harper Collins didn't even set us up one book signing or anything. We got nothing actually from Harper Collins other than they printed the book and gave it to their salesman. And most of those books that they sold, a lot of them came back from the bookstores and they were piled up like the great pyramids of Egypt in my living room. And so I get a call one day from Barnes & Noble in Houston, Texas, and said, do you know who your biggest fan is? And I said, I don't know that we have any fans. <laughs> and uh, she said, oh, no, no, Barbara Bush is your biggest fan, and she buys a case of your books like every week, and we send them out all across America. I said, really? He said, yes. And said, she wants to... Uh, get in touch with you. So you mind if I give her your phone this number? Is the first lady or the granddaughter? Well, no, this is the first lady, the wow. former first lady. Yeah. So I said, um, well, I, I said, of course, that may be the dumbest question anybody ever asked me. Of course you can give her my number. So a few weeks later, Barbara Bush called and asked me to be a part of her celebration of reading. And she was impressed that we had taught Denver to read and write at 65 years old. And so she said, I want you all to be going around with me to telling his story and um, and Did raising money for literacy, huh? Did you get to meet her? Oh, many times. She be, I like, we traveled with her and did uh, a number of events with her. And then she hosted us at the White House when W and, and Laura Bush were president. Barbara Bush hosted a dinner for us, a luncheon at the White House. So you went viral politically. You, you went <laughs> yes. viral before social media, and you had you know, one of the most powerful people in the entire world, the first lady of our country, right. being your promo girl. And right after that, our book became a number one New York Times bestseller. Oh, my gosh. Stayed on the list for three and a half years. Oh, my gosh. Three so and a half millions, years? Yes. Three and a half years. Is that years a record? Consecutive. It was, one, it was kind of a record. Yeah, it was a record for HarperCollins. It's the first... It was the first t time that it happened for them. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm making sure. Um, so, so you you go and uh, have a New York Times bestseller. Did you feel like at that point you had accomplished everything you sought out to do as far as sharing the story with the world? Did you think a movie was even in the well potential I, I realm? Didn't, I didn't really think about it so much. We were so busy just on the road promoting, and incidentally, the money from the book was going to build this new mission in Fort Worth. So, I did not profit from the book. And uh, but I was still going around raising money and speaking on behalf of, of homeless missions. Mm. But um, I was going across uh, a bridge. We were raising money for a homeless mission in, um, in, in Florida, in Tampa, Florida. And we were crossing a big bridge and my phone began to ring. And it was a producer from um, Sony Pictures said, we'd like to make uh, uh, like to option your book for a film. He said, I just made this film called Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith. 
and about the homeless guy that carried his son around with him. And so I said, absolutely. So I gave them the first option to make the film, and they did a screenplay, and I didn't approve the screenplay, and it never got made. So then the guy that did uh, Pursuit of Happy, but the guy that did The Blind Side, Gil Netter, called me. He had a deal with Disney, and so he wanted to make it. And so I went with Disney, and then Disney made it a very dark film uh, that had nothing to do with the story. So I had to sue them and got my rights back from them. And then I was making a independent film when all of a sudden Paramount calls and they said, we want to make the film. So I ended up making it with Paramount. Did you get to cast yourself? No, 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 I didn't get to so, cast. I mean, like, what was that? I mean, was it just a, I don't want to say fairy tale because that's not appropriate, but was it a, a, like a dream within a dream come well, true? Well, we had an Oscar winning producer in Mary Parrott who won the Oscar for The Revenant as a producer. Wow. And, and uh, she was the leading producer for Paramount at the time. So she was doing the uh, the casting. She because we had a very low budget film, and she had very high budget ideas for it. But she was calling on favors, and because we had a story that we thought would impact uh, the nation, uh, people were willing to act at. I shouldn't say this, but below what they should have been yeah, paid. You got everyone got a great deal, including the actors. Right. Um, so Greg Kinnear is you. Greg you Kinnear know, played me. What a, what a great looking guy, you know. And he he plays, he plays your he plays a story, and then you know obviously the rest of the cast, Oscar winners and Oscar nominees, and yes, I had a hard time training Greg, who is really a nice guy, to be an arrogant asshole. <laughs> Did he you get know, there? An arrogant art dealing asshole. Yes. So, uh, but I would sit with him in the morning and just tell him how sick my mind was about art and things, <laughs> and then he could come across because he's generally a really nice guy. Well, he he pulled it off, and the movie's a, a massive success. And you know, again, at, at that point, did you feel like the story had been told? I mean, what was the headspace with Denver? What was the headspace well, with you? How did you continue the legacy after the movie was out and on DVD, and you're you're well, not missable? <clears throat> I've been doing this, you know, Debbie gave me a job to do. She asked me not to give up on Denver. Well, Denver lived with me for 12 years until he joined Debbie in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my new wife, Beth, who um, the, the, our first year of marriage, Denver, it was his last year of life with us. So she got to know him very well. And so she signed on to be part of our foundation, our Same Kind of Difference Me Foundation, where we try to be the 911 call and fulfillment center for emergency needs for underfunded small homeless missions. And we do that uh, right now. We're doing a, a lot of things like that. We're doing right now, we're really involved in food rescue, as I was telling you earlier, to uh, save food, to put food in mouths instead of in landfills and dumpsters so uh, it's an amazing new uh, app that we're working on and trying called, to get funding for eats? now eats e-e-t-z yes yeah. we hope to get it live by april the first but mm, uh, it's really cool yeah so that's uh you know there's, there's a lot going on i support myself by selling art and um fortunately i uh, sold a really important monet this past year and uh, I've got a, a big Van Gogh that we're trying to close on right now with a museum in Japan. So those are fun and exciting things to work on. You know, these great masterpieces that seldom, you know, trade hand, trade hands. So. Wow. Uh, how, how much money do you think you've raised for the homeless community in total? Well, through our book, speaking engagements, our story, movie, everything. I, I, the last count I had was about $110 million. Oh the homeless. What, what would be the next layer of accomplishment for you? Like, how would you go and feel like you're carrying on the legacy of your wife and of Denver and, and your family? Like, how do you see your impact being wider spread than it already is? Uh, being on the Rogers That uh, podcast. Is this the culmination right now? This is, this is the culmination. That's exactly my, what we were hoping that you would say. That's right. Um, this and right now is the greatest moment of your life. It, it, it is up until this point, yes. Wow. So if you can... Uh, refer me to something greater than this uh yeah no i send me on my way i'm just glad someone finally got it you know this is why we did it is we wanted that exact moment where realizing yeah. sitting in this green chair from target or tj maxx with the pillow and mm -hmm. the cup with my face on it this is the highlight of your life it is as of today yeah well the day is still it's still early in the afternoon yeah. um 
Well, you know, I'm working on a Broadway play, so that may there be that may be the highlight. Wow! But, uh, I have a four o'clock Zoom call uh, with the writers and directors of the Broadway play, and uh, William Morris Agency in New York is working on that for us, and it's going to be told from Denver's point of view, wow. the homeless guy, uh, which is exciting to me because our movie is told basically from my point of view, mm. but uh, I'm really. Anxious to hear that. So, you, you, I, for some reason, I, I keep going back to what you you call them. They call them suicide, or they call them the king of the jungle. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what would be? What would, did you have a nickname for Denver? What was the? Well, they called him suicide yeah. or the lion of the jungle. Lion of the jungle. Sorry. Lion of the jungle. Yeah. What did you call him? I called him Mr. Moore. <laughs> Mr. Moore. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I called him Denver. He was like. The, your best high school friend that you, you you were forever, even though he tried to kill me twice. Uh, he was schizophrenic and bipolar uh, and just a crazy, certifiably insane. But here is what I've learned, Rogers. And he taught me this so well. And he was saying this at Debbie's funeral. He said, I have spent my whole life or 25 years on the streets of Fort Worth, Texas. He said, I was a mean man. He said, I was full of hell. But Miss Debbie, she kept blessing me and blessing me and blessing me. She never gave up on me until she finally just blessed the hell right out of me. And do you know what? That was one of the most powerful things I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. You just have to, you can't give up on people. You just have to bless the hell out of them. God. Okay. I mean, is it even fair to ask what the best advice you'd give somebody is? I think bless the hell. It's, yeah. I mean, that's... See, I had to do that with my father. He taught me... See, I had a terrible relationship with my father and that John Voigt played in the film. But, um, in fact, John Voigt told me... I've, I've just now written a new book about my father because I discovered late in life, after I blessed the hell out of my father, he was the father I always wanted and it became the, one of the most beautiful, I thought, uh, love stories of a father and son. But it only lasted a year because he was 90 years old mm-hmm. when I finally blessed the hell out of him. And in the next year of his life, we had a beautiful year together. So mm-hmm. we finished well. Wow. So uh, best advice is to bless the hell out of people. And, and then as far as how we can you know, be our own version of you? What's the encouragement? Well, you know, Denver, the thing that I had to get over, Roger, is I was a terrible judge of people, terrible judge of the homeless. And um, and so one day I was walking the streets with Denver and I was talking badly about some of the drunk homeless people on the streets. So he spun me around and he said, the man you just accused of being a drunk He said, that man was the hardest working man on the streets of Fort Worth. He chose to be homeless because he's from Mexico and he works as a bricklayer and a rock man. And he sends all of his money to feed a family, a a big family back in Mexico. Mm. He said, but the man doesn't drink and he doesn't do drugs. Yet you thought he was a drunk. He said, but the man had a stroke. So we were standing on the streets of Fort Worth on Main Street. He said, what do you see at the end of the street? And I said, I see the courthouse. He said, you sure do. And I said, uh, he said, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Ron. That courthouse is full of judges. And God don't need no more judges. So if you're going to walk the streets with me, you come as a servant and leave your judge's robe hanging in your closet. He said, because I ain't going to have no judging my people on the streets. Hmm. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful thing not to that I could stop judging these people and not knowing what's in their heart. He said, you judged a man, you don't even know what's in his heart or what's wrong with him. You just looked at him and you judged him because the way... He said, Mr. Ron, never judge a man wearing a poor coat because it could be hiding a rich heart. Hmm. And he also told me, I don't know why all you Christians worship one homeless man on Sunday and then turn you back on the first one you see on Monday. Hmm. He said, Mr. Ron, you never know whose eyes God is watching you out of. Now, see, it ain't going to be me, but it might be a fellow that looks like me. God's checking you out to see what kind of person you really are. Hmm. He was profound. No joke. Where do you think he got all of his, his, his wisdom and his he gifts from? He didn't speak to anyone. He just sat and talked to God and listened to people. Hmm. He was crazy. 
but it worked, oh. and it was profound. Wow. I hope our Broadway play gets that uh, message across coming from his point of view. Yeah. But you're talking about never selling out? He became a millionaire, Rogers. He became a millionaire at 70 years old. He died at 75. But from royalties from our book, he took his share of the royalties, and I gave mine to the homeless to build a shelter. But he became an artist. He became a co-author of not only the book. He was the first person in the history of the New York Times bestselling list that became a New York Times bestseller when he didn't even know how to read and write. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, um, but he illustrated a children's book. He, he made over 500 paintings and sold them, wow. became a millionaire, and gave all of his money back to the poor and the homeless. Wow. That's so cool. How, how do we best support you? I mean, obviously the movie, the book, but if you had to give people a call to action today, whether they're watching or listening, whenever it is, what, what's the well, best way I to support if, you? You know, the homeless is not an ex, it's, it's, it's a hard thing for people to grasp. How does you, most people just want to see them invisible and leave them being invisible without knowing their heart. But it, I don't recommend anybody doing what I did. It's dangerous. I did something that was crazy. I did something to fulfill my wife's dream and legacy, but I don't re recommend anybody doing that. But if you want to help the homeless and you want to do something about that, support your local homeless shelters here, like the Union Gospel Mission of Dallas or the Bridge or the Austin Street Shelter. All of these people that are doing great work, support them because they do a lot of good work with, with very little money. Our own foundation, Same Kind of Different as Me Foundation or SameKindFoundation.org, you know, you can, you'll see. Uh, we, we are a small foundation, but we try to do uh, the best we can with a maximum of $2,500 donation that we come in because we, we raise very little money a year. It just comes in from people hearing like today. You know, you may have somebody that sends in $100 or $500 or, you know, we've gotten $1 donations. But It all adds up. It does. And uh, it's, it's a blessing to us to do that, to be able to do that. But to, to support, you know, I buy this Van Gogh from me. That, now, wait a second. <laughs> Full circle. Yes, oh, now we're talking. The best day, I, then I spend $3,500 on it and I trade it, I turn around and sell for $6,500, but I got 90 days to go do it. That's so right. I, I learned that on the show today. <laughs> wow. And even with the art stuff, how do we find out the art stuff, that, the art that you're actually, not stuff, the art that you're selling? Oh, I, I just, you know what? I'm a broker now. I cannot afford. I, I've dedicated the last 25 years of my life to working with the homeless. So, but I still have contacts all over the world. I work a lot with Japan. We just took this magnificent painting from a museum in Japan, sold it to a private collector in New York. Uh, you know, this Van Gogh is coming from a collector in, uh, in, in, in Geneva, Switzerland. And we're selling it to a museum in Japan. But, you know, just Ron Hall, if you have something you want to buy or sell, just Ron Hall at att.net. That's my uh, uh, email address. I'd love to hear from you and love to help you if I can. If I know, if I, if I think I can be of help, I will be of help. But I have a feeling you're going to get a few emails. So Ron, Ron Hall at <laughs> att.net. Um, a man of many talents. A, a, you're, a, you're colorful. And I'm sure you hear this. Obviously, your glasses are colorful, but your personality and your mission. Uh, it's inspiring, and so much so to where on the cover of the book it says the incredible true story that has inspired millions. Which it's way more than millions now. But um, you got a phone, you got a you got a call, and you answered it. And a lot of people get the call and they run from it. But you fulfilled multiple legacies. So much so to where millions of legacies were birthed because you well, took the call. And this one is one of my favorites. This mm. uh, book, working our way home. This is the story of the 11 years that Denver and I lived together as roommates. And if anybody saw the old movie, The Odd Couple, uh, that ain't nothing like this odd couple. Mm. So living together in a home that was owned by the wealthiest people in the world at one time, moving him in from a dumpster to a billionaire's home is one of the coolest stories you'll ever read. Wow. Well... I think we got more to talk about, but for, for <laughs> no, for today, I just want to make sure that we, we thank you for one, uh, for joining us today, but for using your platform, for giving people, uh, just so much love and, and shelter and not, you know, in every definition of the word. And again, full circle that, 
Um, one of my favorite movies and my wife's all time favorite movie, uh, is, is your movie, but it's really the story of your life. And, uh, we, we thank you for that. And I'm grateful for you coming on the show today. Well, I'm anxious for you to look at the Blu-ray of that and oh, see God. the f- scenes that were cut out that I got in a fight Listen, with I, Paramount I, about I, cutting it out. I'm <laughs> telling you, we got plans tonight. And I got I got a feeling we got plans the next few nights. So, right. so thank you. Y'all be sure to check out Same Kind of Different as Me. Check out all of Ron Hall's uh, incredible books uh, and you people that buy and sell art. Ron Hall at att.net. And uh, I have a feeling, too, that in the next year or so, we'll be hearing about the newest Broadway play uh, called The Same Kind of Different as Me from the lens of Denver Moore, who my guess is, uh, was an angel on earth that you got access to uh, better than anybody. So Mm -hmm. thank you for being my friend for joining us today. Oh, what a pleasure. Thank you.